So good morning, everyone. Thank you, Chandi, for the invitation and the introduction. Uh, so I'll be presenting my research mainly in the division. Um, okay. So I'm based at CBSSP, a little bit about CBSSP for people who don't know. Uh, Center for Vision, Speech, and Signal Processing. Uh, the aim of the center is to create machines that can see, uh, hear, and understand the world around them. Uh, it's a center of 140 people with more than 16 academics and a research portfolio of 22 million pounds. Uh, and the area of expertise are quite wide. It's, I mean, AI and machine learning, computer vision, uh, signal processing, image and video processing, pattern recognition and data science. So there's a lot of areas which are covered. And uh, there are people who are working in security, healthcare, uh, medical imaging, and stuff like that. So a little bit about the center. So uh, a little bit about me. Uh, I am basically from India. I've done my master's from India. And I've worked with Samsung for some time. Uh, and I came here at Surrey for a PhD. And since then, I've been there uh, as a research fellow and now as a Royal Academy of Engineering researcher. So I'll start with the presentation about it. So uh, when you see this video, when humans see this video, they can infer a lot of information about it. For example, uh, you can see crowd, you can see a station, indoor environment, people dancing, and also the location of the objects. But what happens when you feed this video to machines? They cannot infer anything out of it. This is just uh, some garbage information to the machines. So uh, we humans perceive the world in 3D. Is that right? Uh, no, that's not right. We live in dynamic world and not static world. So static scenes are something which uh, does not change with time. And dynamic scene elements change with time, like humans and cars. So we perceive the world, uh, the world in 4D, which is 3D in time. That's how we detect actions. That's how we interpret gestures and stuff like that. So uh, what is 4D vision? 4D vision is uh, 4D vision enables uh, creating machine interpretable 4D data from video. So basically, it enables machines to understand the world like humans do. So this is uh, an overall framework of 4D vision. So you have input as single view video or multi view videos. And these videos can be captured with multiple cameras uh, which are moving or static. The idea is to get 3D reconstruction and also track the 3D in time to get the final 4D scene reconstruction and segmentation which is shown on the right hand side. So this is 4D vision. It aims to create special temporarily coherent models from video. Uh, applications, it, it is uh, actually it has a lot of applications. Uh, for example, in robotics, uh, for robots to navigate safely around humans, in self-driving cars, uh, healthcare, smart cities, animal welfare, creative industries. For example, in films, uh, you have seen scenes in Inception. So 3D of those scenes were created and they were edited later on. Uh, in, in security, for anomaly detection, for video surveillance, and in AR and VR recently. So here I have put specific examples of how 4D vision can be used in uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, and mixed reality. So in, uh, this can be used to create online assets for VR movies and games and automatic rotoscopy, for example. In augmented reality, real-time scene uh, analysis from single or stereo view cameras can be used to further understand the scenes and create more uh, rich content. And it makes reality again machine to improve the machine perception of uh, general scenes of uh, the device you're wearing. So I've worked on multiple parts of 4D vision, starting from input to 3D video, then 3D video to 4D models, and uh, finally I've used 4D vision for scene understanding. So I'll be mainly focusing on the last bit, but I will just introduce uh, two methods in the top uh, two categories. So here are some papers which I have uh, published over the years from input to 3D video. And uh, the main contributions have been uh, in feature detection. So I have proposed a new feature detector which could uh, work for general scenes and complex scenes, for example, which are outdoor, and give many more features. For example, here you can see the density construction obtained using SFT, which was a proposed detector, is much more higher. Then I worked in dense dynamic recon uh, scene reconstruction, which means uh, creating 3D content from uh, input videos. And then temporarily coherent reconstruction, where I know which object is what, and then I track the surface 
uh, points over time. So I have the 4D information on those uh, models in the same. So I'll start with the explanation of the multi-scale feature-based detector. Uh, this was published in PIP 2018, um, and early version was published in 2015, just five years ago now. So you have multi view data. And uh, when you want to reconstruct scenes, the first thing comes to mind is feature detection. And these features are matched across to get this sparse reconstruction. So in this scene, for example, with eight cameras, if you use the features, this is what you get. This is the sparse reconstruction you get. But actually, this is what you want. You want a much more dense uh, representation of the scene in the reconstruction, initial reconstruction. So by SFD, uh, the segmentation-based feature detector, it gives large number of features and matches. It gives good scene coverage, improved accuracy, and order of magnitude increase in the reconstructed points. So uh, again, the same, so why SFD? And we have also performed uh, a comprehensive performance evaluation on existing feature detectors such as Harris, uh, CIF, FAST, MSCR, and ACASDE. And here is an example of the difference you can get in the density construction using SFD approach. So uh, the algorithm, so you have an original image. This image is over-segmented using existing uh, uh, over-segmentation techniques, for example, watershed, uh, slick, or thermopixels. And uh, the regions, the region boundaries represent lines corresponding to local maxima. So the idea is that when you're over-segmenting the image, the region lines uh, here, for example, they represent the points of local maxima around that particular region. So, uh, on that region, then we find the point where three or regions meet, and that point is detected as a feature. So this is an overall pipeline. You start with the input images. You over-segment the image using any existing over-segmentation techniques. And features are detected on the points where three or more regions meet. These features are matched across views, and then you get the final sparse reconstruction using the traditional DSFM pipeline. So here are some results on three, uh, three scenes. So Juggler is a public data set which is captured with six moving cameras. And Onsomop and Cathedral are serious SP data sets which are captured with uh, eight static cameras and six, seven, six static cameras and two uh, moving cameras there. So uh, here are some results. Uh, so you, this is, these are the features detected with NSER by SIF. Uh, SFD with watershed segmentation and the number of matches. As you can see clearly, the SFD is outperforming the current methods. And here is the comparison of uh, sparse reconstruction for three different scenes. Uh, and this number indicates the number of points which we're getting in the sparse reconstruction. You can clearly see that this is uh, generating much more uh, points than traditional. Uh, and you're able to get features on the dynamic objects in the scene, not just the static, which is an important thing if you want to use this as an initialization for your uh, reconstruction further on. So that was the SFD. Now the next part. So uh, I have worked quite a bit in dense dynamic reconstruction, but I have selected these two papers. And I'll be mainly presenting this recent paper, which was published last year in ICCD workshop. This is with my student, Akhil Kaliskan. So uh, learning dense uh, wide baseline stereo matching for people. In this paper, we proposed two things. One is a 3D human synthetic data set was introduced, which was used to learn uh, how to match uh, uh, patches in between two images, which are at wide baseline. And a learning framework was proposed to, for, for patch matching uh, to get the final stereo. So uh, this is the the, the, data, the, uh, the data set is called a Synthetic People Stereo Patch Data Set, which is S2P2. It is, uh, we were inspired from R2D2 <laughs> from Star Wars. Uh, so, and this is the generation framework. So uh, we are using simple models and realistic textures uh, with, a cam with a fixed camera setting. And uh, we are using that in Blender to generate uh, images which are at various baselines. So we start from 15 degrees, 22 degrees, 45 degrees, and stuff like that. So this is the uh, framework. And here is an example of the data set uh, which we have generated. So two images which are very wide baseline, uh, ranging from 15 to 45 degrees. And then, so, and the background we have taken, again, from uh, we picked realistic textures from online images. And these are the rendered models on the 
images. So once we have this, um, what we get is we, we can define a positive patch and a negative patch which will be used in the learning framework to get the stereo correspondences. So here an example, the, the blue ones are the positive patches and the red ones are the negative patches which are basically being used in the learning framework. So these are the highlights of the S2P2 dataset. So this is the first large scale stereo dataset for people with 300 simple uh, human model shapes, 200 human textures and 100 motion sequences. Uh, it has 12 million stereo patches in it. The stereo images are, uh, have been uh, rendered for various baselines and it uh, represents realistic textures and human motion is encoded within this. Uh, and this framework, this basically dataset can be used for uh, multiple human reconstruction, multiple human tracking, and human body pose estimation. And we have mainly used this for human reconstruction in this paper. So here is the framework. So we are, this framework is inspired from a work uh, called NCCNN, which was uh, published in 2018. And the basic uh, thing was that they, they, they proposed this CNN module, which is shown there. But the work only uh, considered narrow baseline images, the 5 degree and 10 degree. That's why we have uh, introduced a few more layers to get the reconstruction. And this is the input. Uh, and we have used semantic masks within this framework to constrain the stereo correspondences. For example, we have uh, the so we only search for correspondences within this line here instead of searching for the whole line after the epipolar constraint has been applied. So you take the images, you rectify them, and then basically the epipolar lines are aligned, and then you search for the correspondences within this region rather than searching in this region. It helps uh, with the, uh, it helps in improving the results quite a bit, actually. So uh, here are some results on uh, dynamic stereo reconstruction, and uh, the baseline of the cameras was 22 degrees there, and we can get reliable reconstructions out of it. There are lots of evaluations and uh, more information uh, on the website and in the paper. So you can refer to that if you want to. We move on to the next work. So as I said, in 4D vision, I worked on multiple things. So this was the first thing which I sh sh showed was from input to 3D videos. The next is 3D video to 4D models. So uh, I have worked on 4D match trees, which uh, what uh, that method does is it takes a lot of meshes for the whole sequence and then aligns them. So then you will have full alignment across the sequence and you'll know where the hand of this person will be moving in the next frame and across a uh, thousand frames for example. So this was 40 match trees. This is published in ECCV, so I won't be presenting that because it's a little bit old work. It was published in 2016. Uh, this 40 light field, uh, so basically these two things are uh, light, field, uh, uh, light fields. And the main application of this was to uh, create VR content. So we, this was part of an Alive project, uh, Alive Innovative project, which was done with Ala Foundry and Chemical Productions. And I will be presenting uh, these uh, two work uh, right now. So as I said, uh, this work was a part of a Alive project, uh, which was Foundry and Chemical Productions. Uh, the main application was in virtual reality. And we wanted to address the limitation of 360 degree videos when you're actually watching a movie on VR headset. So you have a VR headset on and if you're 360, in your 360 degree, you cannot feel that parallax. So we wanted to give the user that parallax and that's why this project was, it was first of its kind in, in UK. And as an output of the project, we created a movie called Kids in the Double World and uh, assets from, uh, assets created from our papers were went into that movie and it went on to, uh, win many uh, many awards and it was featured in the Rain Dance Film Festival. It was at Lehmann VR Weekender. We also uh, presented this in SIGGRAPH Computer Animation Festival in 2018. So that, and it's actually available on, uh, on Vroom app if you want to look. It's a 14 minute movie. So the work, the main work which went uh, so we designed this light field rig within uh, University of Surrey where we placed five, uh, we have created a five by five camera array. And this is an example of the capture from that camera array. And uh, the problem is that, the problem with light fields is that it's, uh, there's a very high special temporal redundancy in light fields because the fields are so close to each other. 
and we need an efficient representation to store them, to reconstruct them, and to use those assets within the R uh, framework. So we have uh, proposed this, the sparse light field break, uh, a 4D light field video method is proposed, and assets have been imported to uh, uh, VR using Unity KM engine. Uh, so these are the contributions. We have proposed uh, a method for 4D temporarily, uh, temporarily coherent dynamic light field video from sparse light field rig. Uh, we have used epipolar plane image information uh, for special temporal correspondences and a scene flow method is proposed and we've also created efficient eigen texture representations to facilitate editing for live action VR. So this is the input light field video. We get uh, 2D dense flows, we combine them across views to get the 4D temporal coherence and then eigen textures are used to represent it, uh, to compress the textures which are then mapped onto this 4D uh, uh, 4D models and then those are imported to VR. So that's the whole pipeline. So here uh, is an uh, example of the eigen texture. I mean, this is an algorithm of the eigen texture representation we have done. So given the light field uh, input images, a geometric process. So uh, once we have this, we create the we get the reconstruction and the camera parameters using existing softwares like Visual SFM or uh, Auto Auto photo scan and stuff like that. So once we have that, uh, UV maps are created for each uh, image, for each image, and these uh, UV maps are processed to ensure <coughs> that there are consistent number of pixels by filling any holes which are caused by occlusion or viewpoint changes within uh, the array of images. And then finally, the filled camera maps are used in a PCA uh, based framework to generate eigen texture representation which is much more efficient. So the idea is that instead of using textures from all the uh, images, you use a mean texture and a few textures around it. So it will make, it will compress the whole storage, it will compress how you are going to process the data and it will uh, be easy to uh, uh, edit in future. So here is an example. I hope this video is playing. So, this is a data set. So we uh, we ran it, of course, on our data set, but we also uh, we also took like public data sets and ran this uh, algorithm on those data sets. So this one was captured with 117 uh, cameras, and we have that, and we get the whole scene reconstruction uh, from the 117 cameras, and then the whole eigen texture pipeline is explained here. So you have uh, this image, the camera texture map. And wherever there are occlusions, these are filled in this particular text. For example, if you see here, we are filling that uh, textures in the in the last thing. And once these UV maps have been uh, filled, I mean, corrected for occlusion and stuff, then eigen textures are retrieved uh, using PCA. So this is the mean texture, and this is these are different textures. And basically, you can use the mean texture and a few components of the other texture. For example, one to seven to get the final. Uh, texture map of the uh, of, for that particular frame. So this is the rendered map using eigen texture, and it is good in quality. It can uh, it, it can uh, like it can work with uh, specular reflections and stuff like that, which is good. So I just move ahead. So uh, this is this is the algorithm of the 4D light field video. So how we are aligning the reconstructions in time. So you, you start with input P video, you have the mesh, uh, then keyframes are detected across the sequence. So usually the, uh, the sequences are very long, for example, 1,000 frames, and if you want to align reconstructions of this uh, long sequence, then you get errors in the end. So to fix that, we detect keyframes, and the alignment is done in between keyframes and across keyframes. Uh, so uh, then uh, in the in between keyframes, we get the sparse temporal correspondences using SFD, MSFD, which I haven't used before. And these correspondences are then used to get the light field scene flow, dense light field scene flow per frame and per image. Now this light field scene flow is combined across the 25 cameras to get the final uh, 40 light field video. So for example, this frame was colored uh, blue, yellow, red, green. And the colors are propagated using the correspondences from uh, the scene flow. And you can see the colors are being propagated reliably even when the person stood up and uh, moved backward and forward. So, uh, I don't, so this, this one when I said that uh, the alignment is in between keyframes and across keyframes. 
So if you don't do across keyframes, then the whole uh, sequence won't be aligned. So this is an example of that. Uh, results. So these are a few results. Uh, so on the top you have the light field video, then uh, bigger version of the camera 2, and the light field scene flow for camera 2, and the final 4D temporary quadrant light field video. So we, we tested this on multiple scenes which are uh, close, uh, like, which are short, very close to the cameras, mid-level to the cameras, and far away from the cameras. So the previous scene was far away from the camera, and this was a very close shot, as you can see here. And still the method is able to reliably uh, work uh, with the scene. So as I said before, then all these, the eigen texture representation and this was combined, to, and then reported to VR to uh, be used in that movie which was shown before. Now I will move to the to the main part which I wanted to present, which was 4D vision for scene understanding, and uh, I'm presenting mainly the works from last year uh, from ICCD and NDCD. So um, why 4D understanding? Uh, why 4D scene understanding? So as I said before, a real dynamic world is inherently 4D, and uh, to model and understand the real world, we need uh, the information in 4D, and this can be used for, uh, for example, an analysis of human motion, which uh, is shown here. For example, in sports, it can be used to create realistic uh, interactive media and uh, for robust human-computer interaction in healthcare. So, what is scene understanding? So, I've picked up two definitions uh, from uh, online: one from MPI, another uh, from IEEE 2017 paper. And scene understanding, in contrast to object recognition, attempts to analyze objects in context with respect to the 3D structure of the scene, its layout, and the special functional semantic relations between objects. And the second definition says, the goal of scene understanding is to make machines look like humans to have a complete understanding of visual scenes. So for me, uh, from these definitions, I define scene understanding as uh, a method where you can estimate semantics uh, reconstruction and motion simultaneously from general scene. So that is uh, scene understanding in my. Uh, so uh, I have reviewed a few methods uh, in scene understanding from single view and multiple view both. So uh, there have been methods have been proposed to just estimate the semantic segmentation, uh, to just give the depth, uh, to just estimate the motion. And there, there are very few methods which are doing these problems jointly for the scene understanding. So for example, I'll, I'll uh, just go to the last uh, column of the table. So uh, for example, Kendall et al. proposed uh, a multi-task framework for learning scene geometry and semantics in CVP 2018. Then uh, a joint estimation of depth, camera motion, optical flow, and motion segmentation was done in CVP 2019 from a single view. And in CVP 2019, uh, there was a paper proposed which uh, performed monocular depth estimation with a semantic aware representation to get the final thing. So this was uh, this is all from single view. Uh, actually, in multi view, there are fewer papers which are performing the scene understanding. So uh, here I've mentioned two papers which are performing multi view segmentation. Uh, that multi view depth estimation. There have been lots, lots and lots of papers which are doing multi view depth estimation. Uh, but I will go to the last one mainly. Uh, so this, the first work in scene understanding was proposed by uh, Christian Hain uh, in CVPR 2013, where he did joint 3D scene reconstruction and class segmentation uh, on static scenes. And uh, recently in 2018, again, a joint 3D multi-view prediction and semantic segmentation <coughs> was done uh, by Matthias Nixer and I. And uh, again, that was done for indoor static scenes. So there have been no methods which are working on dynamic scenes for scene understanding from multiple views. So uh, what is existing and what is uh, proposed? So works with static scenes or rigid objects require constrained environments, uh, for example, indoor, uh, static cameras, and manual user interactions are required to get uh, good results. Uh, and basically, they never so 3D is estimated, but not 4D, which is uh, important information for dynamic scenes. And uh, proposed method, it works for dynamic scenes, uh, for challenging environments, uh, moving cameras, it's completely automatic, and it gives a holistic, a holistic scene understanding along with the 4D information, which is 3D in time. So uh, this is 4D vision, 
and then you add semantics and semantics and motion to it to get the scene understanding. So the challenge is, uh, so we have uncalibrated multiple views from static or moving cameras which are wide baseline, typically of the order of 15 to 45 degree which I mentioned before. And the scenes are challenging indoor and outdoor scenes uh, with moving cameras, backgrounds, repetitive textures, uh, large capture volume, loose clothing, multiple people of multiple people which are in, who are interacting with each other, and uncontrolled illumination. So the contributions of this work are so a high level 4D scene understanding was proposed for general dynamic scenes uh, and joint instance level segmentation temporary coherent reconstruction and scene flow was proposed exploiting human priors for human class. So here is an example of the data set uh, for example which I've worked on. So this is captured with uh, five moving handheld cameras. This is a public data set. Uh, it was proposed by Balin in 2010. And this is an example of the results which I get. So for example you have the input images where people are interacting with each other. So I'm going to get a semantic instance segmentation and the 4D reconstruction. For, so this is frame 80 and this is frame 120. And you can see the colors are getting reliably propagated and you are also able to get the semantic instance segmentation of, out of it. So, uh, so as I mentioned before in this work, so uh, we have exploited human 3D post priors to uh, efficiently get the semantic instance segmentation for humans and to refine the reconstruction and other details. So this is the input and this is the output which we are getting. So basically you can see <coughs> that it says, oh these are all static objects, this is a dynamic object which is a human and then you can use the 3D post priors to get the reconstruction for uh, that particular uh, class of uh, the objects. So you have multiple videos as input, uh, you get the initial semantic segmentation using uh, mask RCNN which is the state of the art. However, the mask RCNN uh, produces segmentation with poorly localized object boundaries, so the segmentation is still not perfect. So uh, we will refine. What just happened? Okay, so we'll refine the segmentation later on using the joint refinement. So uh, once we have the initial semantic segmentation, we get a sparse reconstruction of the scene using this pipeline. So we have input images, features are detected using MSFT, which I've shown before. The features are matched uh, to get the final sparse reconstruction. Now this sparse reconstruction, it is uh, clustered in 3D and uh, each color represents a different object in the scene. Now this uh, sparse clustered uh, reconstruction is then combined with the initial semantic segmentation to get the sparse reconstruction of the scene and the idea is to refine this initial model to get the final uh, reconstructed model of, uh, of each object. So uh, once, so now we have the sparse initial sparse reconstruction. Uh, we detect keyframes, which I said before. In keyframe detection. I've been using this a lot because obviously aligning long sequences is hard and it makes uh, it easier. So for keyframe detection, um, I've used various uh, measures. So semantic appearance, distance, 3D human pose, shape, and all these measures are uh, are correlated across the sequence to detect the keyframes. So for example, if you have a sequence of 500 frames, around 5 to 6 keyframes will be detected. And similarly, if you have 1,000 frames, then around 11 to 12 keyframes will be detected. So uh, after that, uh, we detect, so we already know which objects are humans in because, of, because of the initial semantic instance segmentation. And for those objects, we detect uh, uh, 3D human pose ex using existing method by Lotus and Dennis Stone. And uh, we also detect sparse point tracks. So basically, we know how each of these points are moving in time. So using that information, we, uh, we use that information to enforce uh, special and temporal coherence uh, across uh, in between keyframes. So, uh, for example, we define a, uh, so we have a frame like this and we identify similar frames uh, across uh, the sequence and this is used to introduce temporal coherence and it is, uh, it exploits appearance, motion and semantic information along with the 3D human pose. So, uh, while we are doing the final joint refinement which is shown here, we are exploiting information from the previous frames which are quite similar to the current frame. So the idea is to improve the current uh, reconstruction as much as possible using the information from the previous frames. 
So uh, in the end, you get the final reconstruction of the scene. Uh, however, I told before that I have, I'm dividing the scene between static and dynamic objects. So I don't reconstruct the static objects for the whole scene. I only reconstruct dynamic objects per frame. And the static objects uh, reconstruction is basically propagated from the previous frames. So for uh, dynamic uh, for dynamic objects only, the reconstruction will be done. So basically, it's, it uh, it reduces uh, redundancy and it improves the performance of the method. I think I don't need to explain. Okay, I will just explain. Sorry. So uh, so as I said that from frame so static uh, reconstruction is done from frame zero and for the rest of the frames only. Uh, dynamic objects are reconstructed. So for example, you pick two frames and then um, we identify the moving object in the scene uh, in, this, in the 3D uh, reconstruction. And then uh, basically for that particular 3D uh, dynamic points, we identify the sparse tracks which I have shown before along with the 3D pose. So and this is the pipeline to get the initial reconstruction for the next frame. So you have the previous frame mesh. Uh, you perform optical flow for each uh, uh, each uh, view, and uh, you combine this with the sparse temporal tracks to get the dense temporal correspondences. And these dense temporal correspondences are then uh, triangulated in 3D to get the initial post reconstruction, which is then refined using the joint refinement which I uh, uh, showed before in the algorithm. So uh, I'll go through the joint refinement a little bit more. Uh, so it consists of multiple terms uh, which are shown here. Uh, so so the multiple semantic consistency is uh, enforced on labels to improve the segmentation. So for example, this is the input. This is the initial semantic segmentation we got from mask RCNN. And if we remove this term from the optimization, then this is what we get or else this is what we get. So uh, basically it influences uh, the joint refinement quite a bit. And uh, so these two terms are basically introduced to refine the depth at each uh, pixel. So error tolerant photo consistency is introduced to refine the depth, which is this term. And uh, basically it enforces that a pixel, when it is matched, so, so this point, when it is pro uh, projected to these two views, it should match together. So basically that is the photo consistency constraint. And uh, smoothness is used to ensure consistency of depth between neighboring pixels. So here, uh, depth map is shown without uh, smoothness term and with smoothness term. And you can see there is much less noise uh, compared to the uh, depth map without smoothness term here. So this uh, so the data term and smoothness term are used for reconstruction. And then for motion segmentation, we have uh, this term. And it is used to estimate four flow per frame for aligning meshes over time. And here is an example. So frame 11, 19, and 25, uh, these are the 2D dense flows and the final 4D reconstructions. And you can see the colors are being reliably propagated across uh, the sequence. And then uh, we've also used appearance, I mean intensity information of the images to refine the segmentation further. So color information is uh, uses GMM models for initial segmentation. And uh, contrast information uh, adds edge information to the optimization for refining the segmentation. So for example, we get an edge map like this, and that is used within the optimization to refine the edges of the, uh, of, uh, the object. And uh, the GMM information is being used from the initial reconstruction, which we got it in that projected of the image. And we have the background and the foreground here. So, uh, Along with this color and contrast information, we have introduced geodesic star convexity constraint in the optimization. So uh, previously methods have been proposed and they have introduced these uh, shape constraints within uh, the object to refine the segmentation. For example, star convexity constraint was introduced and they said that this star center should be aligned, uh, should be connected to the, the boundaries of the object through straight lines. So this was a star convexity constraint. And they showed that this kind of constraint in an interactive segmentation framework was improving the segmentation quite a lot. However, this star convexity constraint fails in the case of non-rigid objects. For example, this boundary is not connected to the star center uh, through straight line, right? So uh, later on, uh, Gurshan et al. he proposed uh, this uh, 
geodesic star complexity constraint such that the star center is connected to the boundaries of the object through geodesic paths rather than Euclidean rays. However, again, uh, it's hard to connect to this and to improve the visibility, uh, multiple star centers were introduced. And, uh, they, and so, so in my framework, I've used sparse uh, features as star centers automatically within the optimization. This idea was basically uh, from CVP 2016, but I've used uh, in this optimization as well. So here is, here is an example of the segmentation uh, you get. So you have the input, these are the sparse features. This is the segmentation with no constraint, with star convexity constraint, with geodesic star convexity constraint. And as you can see, you are able to retrieve the lens of the object reliably, and even the object boundaries are better because of that constraint. So uh, in the end, pose uh, term, which I have told, I've told before, that the pose term is uh, introduced to constrain uh, reconstructions for human class and to get reliable instance segmentation when the people are interacting with each other. So for example, this is the input. This is no pose and no motion. This is no motion. And this is proposed method where you can reliably see the reconstructions around these uh, connected parts of the object. So here are some results. Uh, so this data is captured with eight static cameras. And uh, on the right, you have the semantic reconstruction. On the bottom, you have the semantic instance segmentation. And uh, again, so we, so I ran this method on the live field data set as well to see how well it works with different kinds of data set and different types of capture uh, settings. And it works quite reliably with the uh, light field data set as well. Uh, in the paper, we have evaluated the method against uh, a lot of existing methods. And uh, as you, so, for example, the reconstruction is compared to four other methods here. And you can see two views of the proposed reconstruction. And you can see the results are much better compared to the previous methods. For example, here and here, quite a bit of difference. And similarly, the flow, uh, I also evaluated the flow, which is an output of the method. And you can see the proposed method works much better. So the red regions demonstrate the errors within the flow. And you can see the red regions are quite uh, uh, less in the proposed method, and the main reason is because of the occlusions, uh, the red regions are occurring in the proposed method as well. And here is uh, an example of the proposed method. So this was the input which I have used in the framework, and this is the final segmentation. And you can clearly see the difference in the quality of the segmentation uh, between the proposed method and this. Here is an example of the assets which can uh, be imported to VR. And you can see the what we are able to see here and here on the screen. And uh, it works in real time. And basically, you can put uh, a location shoot at the back and then essentially create uh, VR content. So uh, to conclude, uh, I've I explained a bit of, so I worked on input to 3D video where I create the construction from uh, multi-view videos. <coughs> then I worked on 3D videos to 4D models and 4D vision for time and understanding. And I explained uh, this paper, I think, and that pre-IP paper, this paper, so covered quite a bit in 40 minutes. So, so uh, however, there are still uh, lots of open challenges. Uh, multiple people and uh, animals. Uh, so, for example, I worked on scenes where they have there were like three or four people. What 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 happens when there is a crowded room like this? How are you able to? How you should be able to reconstruct this scene? And then working from a single view. That's that would be the dream. And then large volumes, uh, limited resolutions. Then modeling hair, uh, freeform clothes. Uh, then handling illumination changes. For example, reconstructing uh, mirrored surfaces or transparent surfaces and dynamic backgrounds, which are extremely dynamic, for example, trees and waterfalls. So these all the problems are still open and unsolved, which uh, I'm trying to work on now, but yeah. Okay, that's it. Uh, thank you.